Praise the Lord. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for keeping us. For I am persuaded Thou art able to keep that which we committed to Thee against that day. Thou, Lord, art our keeper. Thou which keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Thou art our keeper. And we thank Thee for giving us this day our daily bread, as Thou supplieth all of our need, according to Thy riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And as man shall not live by bread alone, but every word which proceedeth out of thy mouth, we thank thee for giving us this day our daily bread. For as newborn babes we desire the sincere milk of thy word, whereby we may grow thereby. Sanctify us with thy truth, for thy word is truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Before we hear from God's word today, I'm going to read this one sentence from the early church writings. This was from Arrhenius of the early church. And he wrote this, and I was very blessed by this. He wrote, he quotes the scripture, Seek and ye shall find. That's found in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. The early church in their writings, they always quoted from God's word. They didn't explain God's word. They did not interpret God's word. They quoted and preached God's word. Matthew chapter 7 verse 7 is written, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. The early church writer Arrhenius quotes, Seek and ye shall find. For the Lord renders his disciples perfect by their seeking after and finding the Father. Once again, hear this sentence. For the Lord renders his disciples perfect by their seeking after and finding the Father. We believe in a closet Christianity. Not in a closet Christianity that is ashamed of the gospel, a Christianity that originates from the prayer closet. Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret. And thy father seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. We believe in a prayer closet Christianity. A Christianity that originates from the prayer closet. You see, that's how I was born again back in 1995. I began praying to the Lord in secret. There in Hawaii, in the middle of the night, looking at the beautiful sky and the stars and the moon, though at the time I was an idol-worshipping heathen, I had turned from my idols now. I began looking at the sky and thinking about the Creator. Who created all these things? Is He real? Is He there? Is there a God? And I began praying to Him. Nobody knew I did so. The Lord Jesus Christ says in verse 6 of Matthew chapter 6, and thy father would see it in secret, shall reward thee openly. No, I didn't go to a church building. I didn't go in front of people and pray. I did not pray at some prayer meeting where people said, oh, that's a wonderful long prayer you're doing. Or I didn't pray with a bunch of people and then pat each other on the back and how long we prayed for and pride ourselves and praying together. No, in secret, back in 1995, without letting anybody know, I began praying to God. I began talking to God. I did not know who he was at the time. I did not know his word at the time. But I saw his creation. The stars and the moon he made in the night sky. I began praying to him. And then God answered my prayer. And because God answered my prayer back in 1985, I came back here to Thailand and answered to prayer. As God answered my prayer, came back here to Thailand and began seeking for this God who can answer prayer. It led me to the Buddhist temple to ask the abbot, at the time I was a Buddhist, to ask the abbot of the temple, can Buddha answer our prayers? And of course he said he cannot. He said, you got to help yourself. I told him my story about how there in Hawaii, I began looking in the sky and praying to God, and God answered my prayer. And he said, no, there's no such thing. He said, you've got to help yourself. You just can't look in the sky and pray for things, and things come to you. He said, no, you got to help. you got to work. you got to take care of yourself. you got to help yourself. I knew that's not the God I prayed to. So then I went to the Mohammedan Mosque. 
is where we live at the time at Lod Prow Road on Soy 130. On Soy 132 was a ten Buddhist temple, and on Soy 130, the soy that we lived on, the road we lived on, was a Mohammedan mosque at the end of the soy, the end of the road next to the canal. And I went to the Mohammedan mosque and asked them the same thing. And they did not have an answer for me. And I began praying to God in secret again. I know you're real. I believe in you. You've answered prayer. Send somebody to me. And then a few weeks later, somebody came to me with a booklet that the scripture from Mark 11, 24, once again. From the book of Mark, chapter 11, verse 24. Now the person who gave me the booklet, he ended up going off has become a false teacher, a false prophet of the day, teaching numerology, teaching in numbers, as if numbers have meaning to them, and almost predicting the future numbers, preaching Bible codes, and predicting the future with them, doing all sorts of false teachings, making merchandise, selling his teachings, making money from his, even selling his own t-shirt he's made, or his own prototype shirt he's made, making money through the ministry, merchandise, as a false teacher does, he became a false teacher. The person that wrote that gospel book, Booklet. He taught erringly and died in this error, which is a damn little heresy, that Jesus Christ had to be born again. That Jesus Christ suffered and suffered on the cross and then suffered in hell and paid for our sins in hell, had to be born again. That's a damn little heresy of the Gnostics. That's a heresy that will damn your souls to hell, which the early church fought against, preached against, and exposed. Because it will damn your soul to hell. Heresy, false teachings is dangerous. It will damn your souls to hell. We don't take heresy lightly. We don't take heretics lightly. Because your soul can be in danger through false teachings of going to hell. It does matter what you believe. And does matter the teachings you hear. And it must line up with God's word. And the Bible says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He did not go to hell for our sins. He did not suffer in hell for our sins. He suffered and died on the cross for our sins. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the person that gave the booklet, he's off and continues off. He's still alive today. There's still hope for him. Maybe the chance he may repent. The person that wrote the booklet, sad to say he died in his unbelief, he's died in his damn little heresy. And if he did not repent, which it looks like he did not, he ended up in hell. But the scripture they quoted, God's word stays the same. Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore I say to you, what things you desire when you pray, but leave that you receive them, and ye shall have them. And it was that scripture that answered my prayers. You see, I'd been praying to God in secret. Nobody knew about it. I didn't go to a church building to pray. I didn't go amongst a bunch of other people to pray. I was praying to God in secret in my room without letting anybody know. And God answered my prayer. I went to look for him in the Buddhist temple. I did not find him. I went to look for him in the Muhammad Mas. I did not find him. And on the street, as of this sky, walking back to the Muhammad Mas, I said, I believe you're real. I know you'll send somebody to me to point me to where you're at, to who you are. And then I received this booklet that had this scripture from God's word in it. Therefore I say to you, what things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. And I said, that's the God I was praying to. That's the God who answered my prayers right here in God's word. It's the God of the Bible. And I chose that day back in July 24th of 1995 to believe the Bible. Whatever is written and contained in the Bible, I would believe. I made a vow to God that if my own eyes contradicted what's written in God's word, I would still choose God's word, even what my own eyes saw. And I was born again. And as I was born again, I continue in the prayer closet. My Christianity, the Christians that I believe in, comes from the prayer closet. We don't look for sacred buildings to worship God at. 
We look for sacred places to worship God at. We look for prayer closets. Whenever I travel, the first thing I look for is not when I'm sleeping, if I'm sleeping in the bed or not. Not what the restroom is like. And I've used some bad restrooms before. I've even used restrooms or outhouses made of bamboo. The toilet was on the little hole in the floor and you had to squat over it. And while I was squatting over the little hole in the floor and this bamboo little structure out in the middle of nowhere on the Thai Burmese border, I saw a man who looked like he was looking at me. I was wondering, can he see me in here? Does he see me? And I waved him, and he waved back at me. He was looking at me, squatting over the hole, use the bathroom. I've used the bathroom in some bad places before. However, whenever I travel, I don't look at the beds. I don't look at the toilets. I don't look at those things. The first thing I look for is a prayer closet. Is there a place that I can pray at? Where can I get a load to pray to God at? When I travel with other people, many times they say, we're going to stay in separate rooms probably. Because I'm going to wake up at 4, 3 or 4 in the morning. And I'm loud when I pray. And if you're not going to wake up and pray with me or pray at the same time, you better find your own room because I'm going to wake up and bother you. I've even had professing Christians travel with me, get mad and upset at me for waking up early in the morning and praying. Our Christianity, my Christianity, the Christian we believe in, is a prayer closet Christianity. It comes from seeking the Lord. Therefore, I was blessed today as I was studying the early church writings to read this sentence Arrhenius. For the Lord renders his disciples perfect by their seeking after and finding the Father. There's nothing like praying to God in secret. Anybody can put on sheep's clothing and go to church. Anybody can put on sheep's clothing and stand on street corners and preach. Anybody can put on sheep's clothing and stand behind a pulpit and preach. Anybody can put on sheep's clothing and stand in front of a camera and preach. But the prayer closet, that clothing has to come off. And now it's you who you are before God. Not trying to act like somebody else. Not trying to put on. It's you before God. That's the prayer closet. That's why you believe in Pray it in secret. Once again, Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. When thou shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy father seeth and seeketh shall reward thee openly. God rewards you when you pray to him in secret. Not in a church building. Not before others. Not at a prayer meeting. No, when you pray to God in secret. When it's just you and the Lord. Now it's good sometimes to pray to other Christians. It's good sometimes to go to a church building and pray to other Christians. That's good too. But nothing beats praying to God in secret. And what did their church writer, what did this early church writer say? The Lord renders his disciples perfect by their seeking after and finding the Father. Perfection. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And where can this be attained at? In the prayer closet. God can deal with those little things in your life that need to be dealt with. God can show you things that need to be dealt with so that you can be perfect. And when you go to these churches today, they make a boast. No, no, we can't be perfect. Look, nobody's perfect. Not one of us is perfect. There is no such thing as being perfect. You're going to a church that does not believe in the prayer closet. You're amongst a group of Christians that do not spend time in their prayer closet. There's a difference between Christians who pray to God in secret and those that do not. There is a difference in a preacher who prays to God and seek before he preaches the gospel than those that do not. There is a difference between prayer class of Christianity and all other forms of Christianity. Because it's in the prayer closet that is where it begins, it's where it starts, and it's where you meet God and where God will reward you. Acts chapter 15 once again. In Acts chapter 15... Verse 28 and verse 29 once again. It is written in Acts chapter 15, verse 28 and verse 29. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. And then the verse 29 contains four in which the apostles, right in the tradition of the Holy Ghost, call necessary things. Good to who? To the apostles, to the elders in Jerusalem, to the early church, and to, most importantly, the Holy Ghost. And written and spiritually, spiritually the Holy Ghost is these four necessary things found in verse 29. 
Now, when he asks professing Christians today, what are the four necessary things? They'll say all kinds of things other than what's written in Acts 15, verse 29. And when he showed them what's written in Acts 15, verse 29, that they're necessary things, many of them cannot receive it, cannot believe it, and won't even look at it. Back in 2009, it was the last time so far, since now we're in 2016, 2009 was the last time that I preached in Hawaii. That means it's been seven years since I preached in Hawaii. Isn't it amazing? Time, actually it's going to be eight years coming up, because it'll be 2017 here, just in a month and a half. It's been 78 years since the last time I preached in Hawaii. In 2009, the last time that I preached in Hawaii, I was traveling by airplane. We left very early in the morning. As we boarded the flight, they put me in the middle. Had another older man on the right-hand side of me in the aisle seat. And an older Western woman on the window seat sitting to my left. And I, of course, was in the middle of them. As I sat down and pulled up my Bible, began reading God's word for a man shall live but alone, but ever heard that we see the mouth of God, the man sitting to my right nudged me with his elbow and says to me, so what do you think about Obama being president? You see, in 2009, President Obama had just been inaugurated as president of the United States of America. And this was in February of 2009, so it had just been inaugurated the month before that. This man sitting next to me professed that he was a Christian. He professed to be a Christian. And as a professing Christian, he was against then-elected President Obama and thought that I would be on his side to say bad things against the current president of the time, Obama. I told that man, well, I think, praise God. I let him know that for eight years, I've been persecuted on the streets for George W. Bush. I told him it's one thing to be persecuted for Jesus Christ, it's quite the other to be persecuted over George W. Bush. And I said, finally, somebody's elected president and wishes that I can blame me, a Christian, for all of his shortcomings. At that, he stopped talking to me. He got offended, you see. As a Christian of America, not a kingdom Christian, an American Christian that also believes in Americanism, patriotism, and nationalism, he believed that George Bush was on the good guy side, was on the Christian side, and that Obama was a bad guy on the wrong side. We as kingdom Christians, we let the world take care of the world. God has the world under his control. We focus on the kingdom of God. We don't get involved in politics. We don't exalt or worship politicians. We don't promote politicians. We're into Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. The kingdoms and nations of this world, they will come, they will go. They will change, they'll depart, but the kingdom of God shall be forever. We are kingdom Christians. We don't mix the Bible with politics. We don't look to politicians as the answers to our prayers. And we sure enough do not look to politicians for revival. No, we look to Jesus Christ. We look for him to revival and him alone, for neither is there salvation than any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby he must be saved. Acts 4, verse 12. As we're flying the airplane now, hours later, I don't know how much many hours later, I was busy reading the Word of God, the Bible. Both of these on both my side would not let me have elbow space, so I was squinched in the middle reading my Bible like this. Praise the Lord. Not a problem, because I was reading the Bible anyway. While I was reading through God's Word, it had been a few hours later, and I'm reading God's Word. This same man, this aforementioned man who professed to be a Christian, he hits me again on the, el on the shoulder with his elbow and says very loud, What do you think about jungle fever? I lifted my eyes from the Bible. As we know from us, we've taught and trained, when you look to talk to anybody, look them in the eyes. So as I, he hit me on the shoulder, asked me what I thought about jungle fever, I looked up at his eyes. His eyes were looking at a screen. On the screen that he was looking at, this is why we look at people's eyes when we talk to them. You can see things when you look in their eyes. If you talk to somebody, don't look in their eyes, you're talking to them blindly. You must look in people's eyes when you speak to them. As he was looking to that screen, on the screen was some African-American singer who had married or was in a relationship with a 
Caucasian, what they would call a white Euro-American model. And on the screen, I guess, it was about their life and who they're living together or their relationship. I didn't watch that documentary, what was on the screen. I was busy reading the Bible. But when he asked me what I thought about Jungle Fever, when I looked at his eyes, so he's looking at, and there was some famous singer with some famous model, I looked at him and said, excuse me, what did you say to me? And he looks at me now and says, what do you or your religious organization there think about Jungle Fever? I had said to him, well, personally, I support Jungle Fever because I'm a product of Jungle Fever. He took his headphones off real fast. He turned around looked at me, looked at me from head to toe, and wouldn't know what I was talking about. See, Jungle Fever means mixed relationship. It's a negative, derogatory word towards mixed marriages. They call it Jungle Fever, especially if it's between what they call white or black. Now, for us, that believe the Bible, there's only one skin color. It is brown. Adam, once again, the Hebrew term means reddish brown. All of us are reddish brown. Some of us are more brown than the others. Some of us are lighter brown than the others. But there is no white people. Nobody is this white. There is no white people, and there is no black people. Nobody is this black. There is light brown, dark brown, brown, reddish brown. We're all brown. Praise the Lord. Well, this man, he called jungle fever, is a derogatory word towards mixed marriages, especially between what they call whites and what they call blacks, light brown and dark brown. So when I said to him that was a product of jungle fever, he could not believe it. He was looking at me from head to toe. What was I talking about? Now let him know. Yes, I'm a product of jungle fever. My father, my earthly father, is a white Caucasian American. And my mother was, she's already been killed now, was a Vietnamese national. And I am a product of jungle fever. He moved now. Gave me the elbow room now. Moved looked at me head to toe with this disgusted look towards me in disgust at me and says to me, that must have been one big white guy. Well, my earthly father is a big white guy. He's six foot four, 260 pounds at that time. Of course, he's lost weight now that he's gotten older, but he's still over 200 pounds. And little did this man know, my grandfather on the Vietnamese side was a very tall and big man. I come from a big family on both sides, you see. Not all Asians are short and small people. My earthly grandfather, your great-grandfather, was a very tall man, a very big man, and was a chief of police and was murdered by the communists in Vietnam. However, on both sides, my uncle Long Su in Vietnam, he is a very big guy, as big as me. I get it from both sides. But this man, in his racist thinking, said that must have been one big white American, because in his mind, Asians are little short, small people. He looked down upon Asian people, though he professed to be a Christian. I opened him to the Word of God. Numbers chapter 12. His headphones were still off. He was still looking me in disgust. I flipped through the Word of God very quickly. Got here quickly to Numbers chapter 12 as the Bible was opened in my hands. Flipped right through God's Word and read this scripture to him. Numbers chapter 12 verse 1. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And I said to him, Moses believed in jungle fever, for Moses was married to an Ethiopian woman. And he looked at the Bible. He looked at me and said to me, I have to look at my, I don't know, I have to look at my own Bible. He didn't look at what book I was reading. He didn't look at what chapter I was reading from. He didn't look at what verse I was reading from. So how is he going to look it up in his own Bible and turn his head away from me? How is he going to look it up? He didn't look up what book it is. He didn't look at what chapter it is. He didn't look at what verse. He didn't write it down. He didn't memorize it. How is he going to look up his Bible? He wasn't going to look it up in his Bible. You see, his mind was made up. His mind was set according to his theology. And yes... There are denominations that teach us in theology about racists. There are a lot of racist theological seminaries out there. 
They teach in races that there's three different races in theological schools. They teach in theological seminaries that Noah's son, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, came up with the three races of people. And they teach that there's three races. There's the Japhethites, what they call white. There's the Hamites, what they call black. And there's the Shemites, what they call the Oriental or the Asians. And they divide up into three different races. And they teach in their theological seminaries and in their theology not to mix the races. Now, the Bible says this in Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Verse 26. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for the dwelling on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord of happy, they may fill after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Hath made of one blood all nations of men for the dwelling on the face of the earth. Not three kinds of blood, not three different races, one blood. And a African-American what they call black man's blood can save a light brown skin or white person's life. They can save each other's life with blood. I myself have donated blood before. You know what they never checked? They never checked what my nationality was. Now they check for diseases, of course, to make sure they have any blood disease in my blood. And praise God, no diseases in my blood. They check that, but they didn't check what my nationality was. They didn't write down a piece of paper, what nationality are you, and put it with the this kind of people's blood or that kind of people's blood. No, they didn't do that. No, you see, we're made of one blood. A black man's blood can save my life. An Asian man's blood can save my life. A white man's blood can save my life. And we can save each other's life with our blood. The God is made of one blood of all men that dwell on the face of the earth. There's no such thing as racist. In these theological seminaries, they teach that Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. They went their separate ways, and they became the separate races, and they teach racism from the pulpits of the churches in their theological seminaries. But there we see Moses, his wife with his Ethiopian. His wife was a Hamite. He was a Shemite. His wife was a Hamite. And their children that were mixed. There's no such thing as three different races. We're all mixed together. There's no such thing as a pure white race, a pure black race, or a pure Asian race. We all come from the same one person, Noah. There's no such thing as pure white, pure black, or pure brown. But this man that was sitting next to the airplane, according to his theological teachings, according to what he learned in seminary, a professing Christian, even coming here to Thailand to quote-unquote shamefully saying, serve the Lord. This man, he thought that the Bible he believed in, from his theological training he had gotten, teaches racism. And he would not believe. He was such a racist he could not believe, would not even look at the Bible, and Numbers of 12 verse 1 saying that Moses had an Ethiopian wife. He could not even look at it, could not even believe it's the Bible, and they came up with the fact that you must have the wrong Bible. I have to check in my Bible. He didn't check what Bible I have. He didn't check what verse it was. He didn't check anything about that. He just came to the conclusion, you've got the wrong Bible. It doesn't say that my Bible and did not talk to me for the rest of the flight and gave me elbow room for the rest of the flight as he leaned over away from me, disgusted, sick, despised me as he considered me a mixed breed or a mixed race person, which his religion, a false form of Christianity, taught him falsely, and false teaching leads to false living, and now he's a man filled with hate could not love a brother in Christ, could not receive me as a brother, could not even fellowship together, would not talk anymore to me, anymore to that, and maybe even miss an opportunity to hear how to be born again, because he was not yet born again. And the Lord could have used me to preach that gospel to him, but he would not hear it from a person he would call a mixed breed or a mixed race. Once again, we come to Acts chapter 15, there's things in the Bible that some people just don't want to look at. 
from their theological backing, from their denomination of beliefs, from what they've already learned, their mind is mina. They know everything already. They know what the Bible says, and they refuse to look at anything that's in the Bible that contradicts what they have learned, contradicts what they believe. Once again, keep your finger in Acts chapter 15. Turn in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 16, once again, that is written. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God as profitable for a theology. No, it does not say that. And as profitable for a theological seminary so you know everything and teach people all that you know and make a lot of money. It does not say that. All Scriptures give given by inspiration of God as profitable for doctrine. What's doctrine? Teaching you how to live your life. You look at the doctrine of Christ, he teaches you what to do. What do you do when somebody smites you in the cheek? Turn to him, the other also. What do you do when somebody is divorced? Don't get remarried or it's adultery. What do you do when there's pornography on? Don't look at it because Jesus Christ calls it adultery, lusting. What do you do when these things? Doctrine teaches you how to live your life. What do you do when somebody asks you for money? Give to all that asks, the Bible says. Doctrine teaches you how to live your life. All scriptures give my inspiration God is prophet for doctrine. For teaching you how to live your lives. If you're reading the Bible not to learn how to live your life, you have missed it. God's Word teaches you how to live your life day by day. How to turn your other cheek, how to resist that evil, how to pray for your enemies, how to love your enemies, how to do all these things that you must deal with each and every day in your life. It's proper doctrine for us, for reproof. Yes, God needs to reprove us. Sometimes we need reproving. We're going the wrong way. We're believing the wrong things. And God's word will reprove us. And for what? For correction. Scripture is given us to God as prophet for correction, to correct you. Once again, the Bible says in Isaiah 53, All we like sheep have gone astray. How do we all go astray like sheep? We have turned each one to his own way. If we go our own way, we go the wrong way. There's no such thing as my way and your way and his way and her way and their way and that person's way and this way. No, there's only one way. And if we go our way, we go astray like sheep. That is found, and keep your finger there, in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. We must search the scriptures no matter who's preaching. As even the Apostle Paul preached in Berea, the Bible says that they in Berea are more noble because they searched the scriptures to see if those things were true. Even if there's the Apostle preaching to us, we must search the scriptures. No matter who's preaching to you, make sure to look it up. In Isaiah 53, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. How? We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scriptures given to us is God has brought for doctrine, for proof, for correction. We need to be corrected. If you go your own way, you're going astray. There is only one way, that's God's way, according to His Word. If you go your own interpretation, if you go by your own teachings, your own coming up to what the Bible says, you've gone astray. You've got to go with this clearly, simply written with the thus saith the Lord in God's Word. And if it does not line up with your life, you need to correct your life. If it does not line up with your beliefs, you need to correct your beliefs. If it does not line up with your thinking, you need to correct your thinking. Because if you go your way, you go astray. And God has given us His Word. It's profitable for correction. To correct us when we're going our own way, when we're going astray. Once again, the founder of the Satanic Church in America, Anton LaVey, he is quoted as saying he's dead now. He is quoted as saying that the most Satanic song ever written was from Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. And according to the founder of the Satanic Church of America, a church that worships Satan, he says that is the most Satanic song ever written. He said it contains all the Satanic doctrines in it. I did it my way. Once again, last week we talked about rappers who sold their souls to the devil. And one such rapper who did so was a rapper who used to be known as Snoop Doggy Dog. 
Now he's known as Snoop Dogg. I forget what his real name is. You can look it up. He used to be a nice choir boy. He used to sing in the church. Grew up in the church, in a Christian church, singing the choir. You look at his old pictures. He's a nice young man. And turn into this gangster rapper. Smoking drugs, guns, glorifies death, violence, glorifies fornication. And in one of his rap songs, I don't know which one it is, and a documentary I've watched which showed the rap video on that rap song, he confessed how he, the devil came to him and took his soul. Gave him, a, gave him a deal that if he allowed the devil, Satan, to control his soul, that Satan would give him money and women and all kinds of riches and fame and fortune if he just let the devil control his soul and to speak this message, to believe in yourself, to trust in yourself, to believe in yourself, to look to yourself. You see, all we like sheep have gone astray. If you go your way, we've turned everyone to his own way. If you go your way, if you start looking to yourself, if you start looking to your heart and fall in your heart or believe in yourself and look into yourself, you're going astray. That is satanic. That's what the church of Satan teaches. I did it my way. That's what that satanic rapper who gave his soul to Satan to use. That's the message that Satan told that rapper to speak to rap about. Believing in yourself. No, we need to be corrected. What we need to correct us is God's word. God's word corrects us. Verse 16. All scriptures give us to God as proper doctrine for proof for correction. God's word corrects us. If you can't receive correction from the word of God... You're in a dangerous place. You must hear what thus saith the Lord. And if you can read the Bible day by day, as man should not live by bread alone, but every word that was seen of the mouth of God, and if you read the Bible daily, and it does not correct you daily, there's something wrong with you. The scripture is given for correction. Keep your finger here. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning of verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he may present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and with out blemish. In order to be part of this glorious church, in order to be presented to the Lord as a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, holy and without blemish, you must first be sanctified and cleansed with a washing of water by the Word. This is why you don't see revival happening in churches today. We read about revival, as we say about the revival in Manchuria, China, back in 1907. Back in 1908, and the revival in Korea back in 1907. We read about revivals that took place in the past. We read about church revivals. We read about the different revivals. But we don't see that happening today in the churches. In today's churches, most churches are dead. So they use worldly music to try to get people moving. They use worldly tactics, dancing, singing, light shows, theater, performances. They have to do these things to get people moving because there is no revival today. And why is that? They refuse to be corrected, to be part of the glorious church, a church in which there is revival, a church in which there is glory. You must first be sanctified and cleansed with the washing of water by the word. How many churches today say, nobody's holy, holiness is impossible. Look, all of us are sinners. We're all sinners. Look at the church around you. We're all a bunch of sinners. That's a church that's not glorious. That's a church that doesn't have revival. That's the church that has the moving of the Spirit of God in it. In order to be part of the glorious church, we must be sanctified and cleansed by the washing of the Word. What's the water do? Cleanses us, washes us. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scriptures give the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction. God's Word must correct you. God's Word must cleanse you as water does. It must sanctify you. It must cleanse you like water. It must correct you. If it does not, 
you're not part of this glorious church. If it does not, you're not part of the church. The Lord will present to himself as a glorious church that have any spot or wrinkle or blemish or any such thing, holy and without blemish. You must receive correction from God's word. For instruction in righteousness, verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Acts chapter 15, verse 28. We need God's word to correct us, to correct our believing, to correct our thinking, to correct our living, to correct even our theology. For many times, theology, what's received as theology, is not in contradiction of God's word. It's not in line with God's word. It's in contradiction with God's word. In order to be cleansed of that, you need God's word to correct you. That aforementioned man that I mentioned that testimony, he would not look at God's word. He would not look what the Bible says about Moses having an Ethiopian wife. No, his mind was made up in his theology. And he would not look at the Bible or allow the Bible to correct his theology. How many people are like that today? And matters that are very serious, such as once saved, always saved, or eternal security. It can easily be proven there is no once saved, always saved in the Bible. It can easily be proven there's no eternal security in the New Testament. You can easily prove them wrong from the Bible, such as, for example, hold your finger in Acts 15, Mark chapter 11. Verse 25. The Lord Jesus Christ says, And when you stand praying, forgive, if you have odd against any. Why? That your Father also which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. What if we don't? Verse 26. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Number one, God is only a Father to those that are born again. For as many as received him, Jesus Christ, to them give you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. God is only a Father to those that are born again. This scripture here is speaking to those whom God is their Father, those that are born again. And those that are born again, whom God is their Father, there is a chance God will not forgive you your trespasses if you do not forgive others their trespasses. And if God does not forgive you your trespasses and you die, you will go to hell. I have showed this scripture to many who believe in what saved, always saved. One man who used to preach with me before, back in the year 2000, a Japanese ancestry, a Japanese American who was born and raised in Hawaii, used to preach the gospel with me in Hawaii, came here to Thailand, even preached with me here on the streets of Bangkok, Thailand before, even held you when you were first born, my eldest daughter back in 2000. This same man got with an independent Baptist church and became once saved, always saved, came back here in 2002, proclaimed that he's once saved, always saved, believes in eternal security. Now was able to drink alcohol. Came here not to serve the Lord back in 2002. Came with his friend. His friend they used to do drugs together with. Now I don't know if they did drugs together or not. I did not see it with my eyes. But this was his friend. He used to do drugs together. What drug? The drug of methamphetamines. And here in this part of the world is very popular. And methamphetamines will damn your soul to hell. The Bible calls it witchcraft. It calls it sorcery. Do you know there's people who will smoke, inject, or take methamphetamines? They call themselves Christians because it gives them dreams at night. And they think those dreams are visions. They think God speaks to them if they take that drug. No, that's not the God the Bible is speaking to them. That's the devil. And there's many like that. In fact, I used to volunteer for a Christian drug rehab. And most of those seeking rehabilitation were professing Christians taking this drug of methamphetamines. They had smoked it, some had injected it, some had taken it as a pill. They did so as professing Christians because they believe when they did so it made them spiritual. They get to see spiritual things. They get to have spiritual dreams and visions. And the more they took the pill or smoked it or injected it, the more visions and dreams they had. That's called witchcraft. That's called sorcery. And if they don't repent of that and die in it, they will go to hell damn for all eternity. The same professing Christian used to preach with me. 2002. Came here in 2002 with a friend of his. They used to do drugs together back in the way. Why was he with this friend now? They weren't serving the Lord together. And claim, came to proclaim to me that he's now once saved, always saved, believes in eternal security. When I showed him this scripture here, 
He said he didn't have an answer, refused to talk to me, and has not talked to me ever since that time because he can't answer this scripture. Back in 2001, there was a pastor, an independent Baptist pastor here in Chiang Rai, Thailand. We were in contact together. He said that he has never seen God use somebody as me, made all these exhortations of me, invited me to preach in the pulpit of his church there in Chiang Rai, Thailand. Praise the Lord. He called me a John the Baptist. Now, he knew I was saved and born again. He even called me John the Baptist. He used to give us tracts. I remember one day he sent us 300 tracts. We gave them all out that day. I wrote to him back in email, said we gave all those tracts. And he wrote back and said, I, he has never seen this before. Give out 300 tracts in one day. I said, if he give us 3,000, we give that out in one day. He had never seen this before. But because it was independent of Baptist, a short time later, he asked me about what I believed in eternal security. It is not in the Bible. I do not believe it. He became very angry at me. He began debating with me, got mad at me. I showed him this scripture. He would not answer it. You know what his answer to me was? You go to hell. Now, he believes in once they've always saved. And he knows I was saved. He knows I was born again. So born again, in fact, he called me John the Baptist. Now, of course, I'm not worthy of that name. I'm not a John the Baptist, not even close. But that's what he called me. He said that I was saved. He said never, God never, he's never seen God use somebody like me. Now, of course, God uses more people more than me, praise God. But that's what he said. And now he's telling me, I'm going to hell. He doesn't believe once saved, always saved then, if he thinks I'm going to hell. But because of this scripture, he had no answer for. This scripture proves eternal security, once they've always saved, is not New Testament Christianity. Acts chapter 15, verse 28. Yet there's many who believe in once they've always saved. They believe in it so much so, they will not allow them God to use his word to correct them. Here in Thailand, sad to say, the independent Baptists got their hands on the word of God. They made a Bible version they put on the front in the Titan, they call it King James and Thai. They call it the King James. That is the authorized version. They call it the Thai King James. Do you know what those hypocrites, those evil men did? They changed the word of God in Mark chapter 11, verse 25. They took out the word trespasses as in regards to sin and put another word in there, which does not mean sin. And they say, see, God will forgive you your shortcomings. And he may not forgive you your shortcomings, and you won't get your reward in heaven if he doesn't forgive you your shortcomings. They didn't use the word trespasses as is in the English tongue, and they dare to call that Thai Bible a Thai King James as if it's an authorized verse of the Bible or translate the authorized verse of the Bible. Those sneaky people, those deceivers, those who are corrupt and corrupting God's word took something like the King James Version, the authorized verse in time, and put in their own Baptist doctrines in the translation to make God's word line up with their theology, with their doctrines, and not allow God's word to correct them. They corrected God's word with their theology and their false doctrines, and don't allow God's word to correct their theology or their false doctrines. Many are like that today. And in verse 28 is written, For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. We need to know what these necessary things are. Because it's necessary. It's something that we need. It's important. If there's anything that's important for a New Testament Christian, it's found right here in Acts 15, verse 29, because the apostles, they written on the Holy Spirit, says it was good to the Holy Ghost and to us. It's also good to the Holy Ghost. And the Lord does not change. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The Holy Ghost does not change. If it was good to the Holy Ghost way back here in Acts 15, verse 28, is good to the Holy Ghost now in 2016. Verse 29, that you abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled. Why is abstaining from things strangled important to God? Why is this good to the Holy Ghost for us to abstain from meats that are strangled? Why is this a necessary thing for Christians 
to abstain from meats that are strangled. Why is this necessary? Why is this written in God's Word? Why is this good to Holy Ghost? Why is it a necessary thing? Once again, Leviticus chapter 17. Leviticus chapter 17. Verse 10 on, it is written. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, of the strangers join among you, that eateth any manner of blood, any manner of blood. I'll even set my face against that soul that eateth the blood, and I'll cut him off from his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. Why does God turn his face against those that eat blood, any manner of blood? Because God uses blood to make an atonement for your souls. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Therefore you must abstain from me all manner of blood. Up here in Thailand, especially in the northeast and the north of Thailand, they like to eat raw fish, fermented fish. In the Thai tongue, it's called balat. It is fermented fish. It is fish that is raw. It is uncooked. They allow it to ferment. They don't cook it. It ferments, and then they eat that. Now, not only is it dangerous to your soul, it is also very dangerous to the body. Any doctor will tell you, all fermented fish contains fluke. Fluke, F-L-U-K-E, is a parasite that goes straight to your liver. And those eat fermented fish. It's raw, it's rotten fish. It has this parasite called fluke in it. It goes to your liver, shuts your liver down. Then you have heart failure and all the other problems that come when your liver shuts down. Most people think that people have bad livers here because all the alcohol they drink. And yes, most of them in here drink a lot of alcohol. And yes, alcohol is bad for the liver. But the women also have liver problems here. And a lot of the women do not, or there's women, a lot of women do, but there's quite a few that do not drink alcohol. And yet they have liver problems as well. Here, down here in the slum area where we live, as we minister to the people there, they, many people are dying. And just, what, two weeks ago, more people died? And they died of heart problems from the liver, and they all blame the papaya salad, the sum thumb. They don't know what it is for the sum thumb, but the doctor says the sum thumb is doing it to them. Sum thumb is bad for your health. No. It's not the sum thumb. It's the fermented fish they put in there. It gives them fluke. And then when that parasite gets in their liver, it shuts the liver down, which shuts the heart down, and they die. And they die in large numbers because of fluke, because of eating this fermented fish with parasites in it, because it's raw, it's uncooked, it's rotten, it's very bad for you. And the doctors keep trying to tell them, don't eat it. And they still do. And then they blame the whole dish of papaya salad. There's nothing wrong with the papaya. There's nothing wrong with the salad. It's the fermented fish they're putting into it that's killing them. You see, the Bible says not to eat any manner of blood. It's bad for your health. It gives you parasites. Just like we talk about the fermented fish. It's killing people here. It's destroying their livers. It's putting parasites into their livers to shut their livers down, which then shuts their whole body down. But also the Lord says... I'll even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and will cut him off from his people. Why? For the life of the flesh and the blood, and I have given to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. Verse 10 once again, all manner of blood. The whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or the strangers join among you, that eateth any manner of blood. Any manner of blood. God said he would set his face against that person. Because blood is given for the atonement for the souls. Acts chapter 15 once again. Verse 28. For a seem get a little ghost in us to lay upon you no greater burden these necessary things that you say from meats offered idols and from blood and from things strangled. Why from things strangled? Because the Bible says all men are blood. Any manner of blood. And strangled meat still contains the blood in it. And here in this part of the world, as an example, in which the majority of the population eat blood, 
They put it in their soups. They eat blood pudding. They eat raw meat. They eat raw foods. They add extra blood to their food. And they also eat strangled meat as well. And why do they strangle their meat? Why do they kill it by strangulation? To keep the blood in the meat. To save that blood. And this is why the Bible commands us it's a necessary thing to abstain from things strangled. Because you eat strangled meat, it's the same as eating blood. It still contains the life of the flesh in the meat. The blood is still in the meat. When I was a young boy, I was at my aunt's house. Her name was Chiba. She's passed away now. My mom's earthly sister, your great aunt, your aunt, oh, your great aunt, grand aunt, Chiba. And I was a little boy. And there was ducks in the kitchen. And I was watching these ducks walk around. And Chiba, she grabbed this duck with her bare hands, whipped it over here, and twisted it with her bare hands, strangled that duck to death. And as a little boy, I could not believe Chiba, this nice Vietnamese auntie, was such a brutal killer with her hands. Needless to say, I did not eat duck that night <laughs> after seeing that. I was a young boy. I will never forget watching her strangle that duck. Back in 2004, I was on the Thai-Burmese border, and they were going to eat goat. And I was going to eat the goat with them because at the time I was still eating meat, and I, I liked goat meat until I saw what they did. I, they had that goat, and they are going to kill the goat. And I was going to stand around there with her because that's what the men were doing. The women were cleaning and washing and boiling things, and they would hang out with the women. And the men were going to kill this goat. So I had to choose women or the men. So I'll go hang out with the men. And they let this goat go. One guy twisted that goat with his bare hands. A man from the Karen tribe with his bare hands choked that goat. Tongue coming out and everything. Choked it to death with his bare hands. I had never seen somebody choke a goat to death with their bare hands. The thing was kicking, making noises, and he with his bare hands, and everybody was watching him. It was like some kind of, you know, right to manhood or something. I don't know. We're all in the circle watching him strangle this goat with his bare hands and kill that thing. I didn't eat goat that night because the Bible says to abstain from things strangled. Up in Kankan, Thailand, which is going to preach the gospel quite often, they killed chickens there. And they had this whole catapult thing for the chickens. I, I didn't know, what are they going to do with this? What is this? What is this thing here? And they tied this rope to the chicken's neck, and they used this catapult to hang them. The chicken would flap and kick and make all the noises, and they choked that chicken to death. That's how they eat the chicken up there. They eat meats that are strangled here. Why do they do so? Because of the blood. They want that blood in the meat. They want that blood and eat it. They want to drink that blood. They want to cook that blood. They want to add the blood to their soups. They are blood eaters. They're cursed here. They worship idols. They eat blood. They fornicate. They sell their daughters off to harlotry. They live off whoredoms. This is a cursed place. These are heathens. They don't know the Lord. They're very far from the Lord. Many people say to us, why are you preaching to these Buddhists? They're such nice people. No, they're heathens. They're on their way to hell. They're on everything that the Bible says not to do. And one thing they're doing is eating blood and things strangled because they want that blood in the meat. The Bible says to abstain from it. Why? Because if he eat any matter of blood, God says in his word, he will set his face against you. Is there revival amongst these blood eating Christians here in Thailand? There is no revival. Is there a move of God's spirit amongst these blood eating Christians here in Thailand? There is no move of God's spirit. Are they out there preaching the gospel, going to the preaching gospel of every creature? They do not do so. Why not? As I preach their churches and can exhort them to obey the Lord Jesus Christ, to go to the Lord preaching gospel of every creature, they cannot do so. They lack power. And they even confess it. They lack power. And why is it they lack power? Because God has not given the power. God's face is against them. When they hear our testimonies, they live by faith. How God answers them, they cannot believe us. They think it's impossible. They have no belief. And you can live by faith. And we tell them our testimonies, they think we're either lying or making these stories up, or they just refuse to listen to it because it doesn't happen in their lives. Because the face of the Lord is against them. God says, if he any man or blood, he will set his face against you. Because blood is given to make an atonement for the soul. It's something special, sacred, holy. In God's sight, the life of the flesh is in the blood. And he commands us not to do so, even in the New Testament. Not anything strangled. 
That's so much God is against blood eating, even in the New Testament. For the Lord does not change. And if he can to do so, his face will be against you. And his face is against you. He will not answer your prayers. He will lack power. And that's why the church here in Thailand is so weak and so powerless. God's not with them. This past Wednesday night, as I went to preach the gospel on the Middle East Street, in a rainstorm, the whole time we're going there, the thought that kept coming to my mind was the last words of the late evangelist John Wesley. But the greatest of all is, God is with us. And I, just, the thought just kept coming to my mind. The greatest of all is, God is with us. And the Bible says, if God before us, who can be against us? And then we arrived at Sugar Road this past Wednesday night, got out of the taxi, opened the umbrella up, got the tracks out, walking on Sugar Road. Where's, where's the rain noise? What happened? Something wrong with my umbrella? What's going on here? I reached out there and there was no rain. Took it down. It has stopped raining when we had gotten out of the taxi. It was raining when we were in the taxis. By the time we got out, the rains had stopped and it didn't rain again. Joined the taxi right back home. Preaching the gospel there in the Middle East Street. When we arrived there, the local vendors knew we were coming. How they know so? They saw the rain stop. It must be that preacher's coming here because they know this of us, that God is with us. And again, we didn't have enough cash with us to make it back home. We didn't have enough cash to go and come back. We went anyway because God is with us. And by miracle of God, some man, don't know his name, didn't even talk to me. I went to give him a gospel track. He put something out of his pocket, put it right to my hands, and it was 70 bought in cash, leaving $2, but enough to get us back home. Praise God. We didn't have to walk this past Wednesday night. God is with us. That's why we can go into the world and preach the gospel of a creature. That's why we can live by faith for these past 21 years. For God is with us. His face is shines upon us. His ears are open to our prayers. His eyes are over us. His lips speak to us. Praise God. And with God with us, we can obey His word, fulfill His will to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What about those professing Christians eating blood that we know here in this country, all over this country? The majority of them eating blood. We're under grace. We can eat this. No, that's Old Testament. That's all. We can eat blood. Where are they at? They're not preaching the gospel. In this population of over 99% are going to hell. They're not professing to be Christians. They're not preaching the gospel. They have no power. The Lord's face is against them. And in their church buildings, they got to pay people. they got to entice people to come to church because there's nothing there. The Lord's out there. They're going to have the worldly music, the lights, the show, the entertainment, because the Lord's not there to try to attract people to come to churches, have musicians, worldly musicians, sing in the church, trying to have concerts, trying to get people to come to the church. They're not coming because the Lord's not there. His face is against you if you eat any manner of blood. And that's why it's written here that this is a necessary thing. It's good the Holy Ghost and to us, the apostles and the others, it's a necessary thing to abstain from meats off idols and from blood and from things strangled. Because he any man or blood, the Lord's face is against you. How many pressing Christians will call us, or before they did, they don't do it anymore, call us for help. Can you help us with this? Help us with that. Help us with our rent. Help us with building this new church. Help us with this library. Help us with, and we'll say, okay, we'll pray for you. And they hang up. They take prayer as a no. Do you have any money? Help us with I'll pray for you. They, they hang up. That's it. They, they think prayer is a no because prayer to them is useless. When they pray, God doesn't answer. That's where they're a bunch of beggars. That's where they're a bunch of scammers and schemers. That's where they're that way because God's face is against them. This is New Testament Christianity. It's a necessary thing to abstain from eating blood and from things strangled. With that in mind, what meats can you eat here? Cooked sea fish, and that's about it. Even the halal meat, the meat of the Mohammedans, though they don't strangle their meat, they still dedicate to their false god, Allah. And be that Allah is not the God of the Bible, it's a false god, and their meats are dedicated to Allah to make it halal, we don't eat that meat either. So as a professing Christian living here in Thailand who obeys God's word and obeys these necessary things, you have to abstain from us all meats here because it's been strangled, it still has blood in it, and the life of the flesh is the blood, and if you eat it, amen our blood. 
the Lord's face will be against you. Therefore, it's a very necessary thing. Yet so many professing Christians, here in Thailand especially, will not look at these scriptures, will not believe them. Years ago, back in 1998, I had to go do a visa run in Malaysia. And I went with this missionary from America. We went down together, do the visa run together. And your mommy stayed with his wife. His wife was born in Thailand, half Thai and half Malay, and stayed at their house. And her father, that man's father, law, her father was a pastor of a church, and they lived in the neighborhood where the church was and the pastor was. And while I was in Malaysia on this visa run, they all teamed up on your mother and tried to get her to eat blood. Say, <laughs> you had to eat blood. You see, in this heathen culture, being that it's based on Buddhism, and Buddha ate pork that was spoiled, and then according to Buddhism, he knew it was spoiled, but he ate it anyway to make people's karma feel good. He knew it was spoiled, he knew it would kill him, according to Buddhism, he ate it anyway to make everybody's karma feel good, and that's what killed him, eating this spoiled pork. Now in this Buddhist society, this heathen culture, they think if you don't eat what we offer to you, you offend us, and they want to force you to eat things you don't want to eat. And when they found out your mother was a New Testament Christian, though they're Christians, this woman's father, earthly father, was a pastor of a church. They were Christians of a denomination here in Thailand. They were Christians. They found out she didn't eat blood. They tried to force her to eat blood. And she stood her ground saying, it's in the New Testament. They said, no, that's the law. That's the wrong dispensation. They came with every argument they could of why you can eat blood, and she refused to do so. Now, here in 2016, we can follow those people on social media. And that same professing Christian woman, wife of this missionary who made such a stand about eating blood, she's in the hospital more times than she's out. And every time she's in the hospital, she posts on social media, it's because of food poisoning, because of her stomach. And she can't figure out what's wrong with her. The doctors can't figure out what's wrong with her. And she continues to go in the hospital over and over again. She'll do a healing crusade. What a hypocrite. Pray for others to be healed and then come back to where she lives and have to go to the hospital with food poisoning again or, or her stomach's upset or she's throwing up and vomiting and diarrhea and so all of a sudden she can't figure out what it is. It's because that blood eating, the face of the Lord is against her. She can't even get healed herself. How dare she pray for others to be healed when God can even answer her prayers for her own self. That's hypocrisy. She is a hypocrite. The face of uh, the Lord is against her. Way back in 1998, the Lord used somebody so simple as your mother to make a stand in New Testament Christianity. It's a necessary thing to abstain from blood and from meats strangled. We must abstain from any manner of blood, even strangled meat, if you want the face of the Lord to shine upon you. This is good to the Holy Ghost. It was good to the apostles and the elders and the other church. And it is a necessary thing. Let us be doers of God's word. Let us continue to abide in Christ. And his words abide in us. Let me ask what we will. And it shall be done unto us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy word which endureth forever. Thy word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Be it unto us according to thy word and sanctify us with thy truth. For thy word is truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord.